In this module, we are going to look at an overview of different modes of heat transfer. But first, let's ask ourselves a question. Why do we want to study heat transfer? Well, it's safe to assume that if you walk into any food processing plant, you will find some example of heat transfer. There are just numerous operations that require transfer of heat from some type of heating medium into a food. Uh, so in a food processing plant, we want to ensure that heat transfer occurs in the most efficient manner to avoid waste and higher costs. Let me give you three examples of why we want to study heat transfer. And I'm sure you can add more to this list. Uh, first, we want to examine how rapidly foods can be heated or cooled. In other words, what is the rate of heat transfer. Second, to design new heat transfer equipment that allows high efficiency of heat transfer. Third, how to evaluate the performance of a heat transfer equipment in a processing plant. With these objectives, let's look at three common modes of heat transfer, conduction, convection, and radiation. We will first briefly examine conduction. Conduction is the most common mode of heat transfer in solid materials. From physics, we know that energy transfer in any solid occurs at a molecular level. The molecules on one side that is heated get agitated when they acquire thermal energy and they vibrate at increased frequencies and they pass on that energy to the neighboring molecules and thus heat gets conducted from one side of the solid to another. However, note that there is no actual physical movement of the material. Uh, this characteristic of conduction clearly differentiates it from another mode of heat transfer that we will examine a little bit later. So how do we mathematically describe conduction? This actually was done by a person by the name of Joseph Fourier. To understand his reasoning, let's just look around. If you are sitting in a room, then let's see how heat is transferring through the wall. If you are located in the northern hemisphere, uh, and let's say if it is winter, then uh, outside is probably quite cold, and your room is uh, probably heated. So heat is transferring through the wall from the inside of the room to the outside. Let's try to list items that will affect the rate of heat transfer from the inside of the room to the outside through this wall. 1. The surface area perpendicular to the direction of heat transfer. Uh, so the surface area would be the length times the height of the wall. So it is important to note that the surface area is perpendicular to the direction of heat transfer. You can see that in this short animation. Okay, the second item. The gradient in temperature through the wall. Uh, that is the temperature difference between the inside of the room and the outside and we denote that by the term delta T. Three, the thickness of the wall and uh, we will call that delta X. Now Fourier took these three items and came up with a relationship and this is how he expressed it. Q, which represents the rate of heat transfer, proportional to A for area times delta T over delta X. So why did he arrange these terms in this manner? Well, the reason why he formulated his equation in this manner is as follows. If area increases, the rate of 
heat transfer will increase. Well, sure, that makes sense. If the temperature gradient is larger, then the rate of heat transfer will be greater. For example, if the outside temperature suddenly drops, then there will be more heat transferring to the outside. If the thickness of the wall is larger, then the rate of heat transfer will be decreased. Well, if you visit some really old buildings, uh, especially, uh, for example, churches built uh, maybe a couple of centuries ago in Europe, um, you will find that the walls are probably made of stone and uh, they are typically two to three feet thick or uh, 60 to 100 centimeters uh, thick. And these buildings typically uh, stayed quite cool during summer. Now, of course, the reason why they wanted these very thick walls was to build really tall structures. Now, note that uh, Fourier's expression had a proportionality sign. We need to convert that into an equation. Now, the step of replacing proportionality with an equation sign involves introducing a constant and a negative sign. So we will have Q equals minus K A delta T or delta X. The constant K is called thermal conductivity. Note that we always use lower case K to represent this constant thermal conductivity. Thermal conductivity is a property of the material that makes up the wall. And the units of thermal conductivity are watts per meter Celsius. I'm sure you're wondering why do we have a negative sign? Well, by introducing negative sign, we ensure that heat transfer is always a positive number when it transfers from high temperature side to low temperature side. Recall from physics that positive heat flow is always from high temperature to low temperature. This is to meet the constraints of the second law of thermodynamics. So let's look at a plot which will show us how the temperature gradient is uh, through this wall from the inside to the outside. Now if we use a coordinate system uh, with x, as x increases the temperature will decrease. Let's put some numbers. As x increases, let's say from 0 to 15 centimeters, then the temperature is decreasing from 20 to, let's say, 5 degrees C. Then delta T over delta x is 20 minus 5 divided by 0 minus 15 or 15 divided by minus 15 and that will give us minus 1 for delta T over delta X. When we use this value in our equation, the two negative signs, the negative sign with this slope and the negative sign that we introduced when we converted that proportionality sign to an equation, those two num negative signs will be multiplied together and you will get a positive number. So that will keep our physicist friends happy that heat transfer from a high, higher temperature to lower temperature is a positive number. Let's also get an understanding of an important thermal property of materials we call thermal conductivity. First let's look at its units. Recall I mentioned earlier that the units of thermal conductivity are watts per meter degree C. Now also recall that one watt equals one joule per second. So we can say that the units of thermal conductivity are joules per second meter degree C. So what do the units tell us? Remember that joule represents the quantity of heat. So we can, by looking at the num these uh, units, we can say that thermal conductivity tells us as to how much heat in joules will transfer 
per second if the wall is one meter thick and the temperature difference between the two faces is one degree C. So intuitively you will guess that a material with high amount of heat transfer will have high thermal conductivity. So if the thermal conductivity value is high, you know, there will be more joules that will be transferred. Metals have high thermal conductivity values. Those values range anywhere from, let's say, about 20 to 500 watts per meter degree C. In air, we know is a good insulator. In, in fact, in case of air, the value of thermal conductivity is 0 0.0251 at about room temperature. In fact, there are very few materials that have thermal conductivity lower than that of air. Well, since air is cheap, if you create a material with lots of air embedded in it, then the thermal conductivity of that material will be low. If you are wearing a sweater or a fleece, the fibers of that material have air, air entrapped between them. The reason that a sweater gives you very good insulation and keeps you warm during winter. Many insulating materials used in the industry have air trapped in a matrix, such as fiberglass or different types of foam. Water has a thermal conductivity of 0 0.597 watts per meter degree C at uh, about, again, room temperature. This is also quite low compared with metals, but certainly it is higher than air. So if you have an insulating material, and uh, if that insulating material gets wet, uh, for example, your sweater or fleece gets wet in rain, then it will not keep you as warm as a dry sweater. So in the industry uh, where, for example, in many of the food operations where one has to wash uh, the uh, process equipment, uh, you have to cover that insulation with some type of a uh, protective material uh, to make sure that the insulation does not get wet and uh, lose its uh, insulating property. So how about foods? So let's say that uh, you start working in a food processing plant on the very first day. Uh, somebody asks you for uh, sort of an estimated value of thermal conductivity of strawberries, fresh strawberries. Uh, what would be your estimate? Well, think about it. Strawberries are mostly water. So the thermal conductivity would be close to water. So if you gave a rough estimate of, let's say, 0 0.6 watts per meter degree C uh, for a sort of initial calculation, uh, you would be pretty close. On the other hand, if you have a freeze-dried strawberry where the berry has hardly any water uh, and the pore spaces are mostly filled with air, then the thermal conductivity will be closer to that of air. So you can get uh, more accurate values uh, for foods by looking up in uh, tables uh, of values uh, for properties uh, in uh, handbooks. Since uh, many of the physical and thermal properties are influenced by the composition of the material, there are equations developed specifically to estimate thermal conductivity of food, if you know its composition. One such equation is as follows. K equals 0 0.25 mc plus 0 0.155 mp plus 0 0.16 mf plus 0 0.135 ma plus 0 0.58 mm. Now in this case, in this equation, M refers to the mass fraction. So it's the mass fraction of the various uh, items that are composed in that uh, product. 